Today we will start the study of magnets and magnetic fields. Magnets has been known to man for many, many years. Ancient Greeks and Chinese knew about the magnets. Now, that time it was called the lodestone. It was said that an ancient Chinese shepherd you know that a shepherd uses a, a stick with a metallic kind of a hook. Apparently, when he was guiding a flock of sheep, his uh, stick got stuck on a rock. It got stuck on a rock. Now, when he checked, he found that the metallic end has been attracted by the rock. Well, apparently, that is the first discovery of magnetism. Well, what is the specialty of a magnet? Well, of course, we know it attracts magnetic materials. Is that right? A magnet attracts magnetic materials. Well, I have a magnet here. You can see it's, it's very strong. So a magnet attracts magnetic materials. And Another property is the directional property of a magnet. If uh, you suspend a magnet freely like this, no matter how you rotate it, it will always come to rest in the north-south direction. And that is the origin of the magnetic compass. I'm sure you have seen magnetic compasses. Is there anybody who hasn't played with magnets when you are a child? Now, this is a magnetic compass. Well, it works only when it is flat on the surface. You can see the north end of the magnet and the south end of the magnet. When it is freely pivoted, the magnet will come to rest always in the north-south direction. And this property was used by ancient mariners, people who traveled by ship to find the direction because there was no other way to find directions. Well, I have actually put all these things down, you know, in the PowerPoint and uh, we will take a look at it as we move on. Well, here is the illustration of a magnetic compass. The, the end pointing north is called the North Pole and the one that points south is called the South Pole. And this is another illustration of a magnetic compass. So a magnetic compass or a magnet has a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, the North Pole and South Pole of a magnet are actually similar to the positive and negative charges in electricity. So, we will see there is a lot of comparison between electricity and magnetism. Now, materials that are attracted to a magnet are called magnetic materials. Now, from your experience, can you tell me what are some of the common magnetic materials? Well, iron, nickel, cobalt are all examples of good magnetic materials. Just like in electricity, there is interaction between positive and negative charges. There is interaction between magnetic poles. Now, like poles repel and unlike poles attract, which is something very easy to understand. A North Pole will repel a North Pole and a North Pole will attract a South Pole. But the problem in magnetism is, unlike in electricity, magnetic poles do not exist freely. In electricity, you have a positive charge and a negative charge that exists freely. But in magnetism, these poles do not exist freely. Now, what happens if I take a magnet like this? See, so this is a magnet which has got a North Pole and a South Pole. 
If I break this into two pieces, each will be a magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. If I break this into a million pieces, each will be a small magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, such a small magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole is called a magnetic dipole. In other words, there are no magnetic monopole. There are no magnetic monopoles. Magnetic poles always exist as dipoles. Now, all magnetic materials, iron, cobalt, nickel, are all made of these tiny magnetic dipoles. That's an important concept. All right, it is now time to talk about magnetic field. I don't think it is difficult for you to understand the concept of field now. We talked about the concept of electric field. A field is a three-dimensional region, is that right, where a force is experienced, a force is felt. In fact, any kind of force can be expressed by talking about a field, gravitational field, electric field, magnetic field. So what is magnetic field? The magnetic field of a magnet is a three-dimensional space around that magnet where it will exert force on other magnets. That's right. That is the definition of a magnetic field. Now, a magnetic field around a magnet can be studied by using field lines. Are you familiar with the concept of field lines? Yes. In electricity, we talked about field lines. And in electricity, we used a positive test charge as a standard charge. Now, what do we use as a standard in magnetism? We have a North Pole and a South Pole. And remember, they don't come as individual poles. So we got to make some imagination. So as a concept of imagination, I would say, let us take the North Pole as our standard pole, as our test pole. So what would then be a field line? A field line will then be the direction in which or the path that is taken by a test pole. A test pole is a North Pole. Now, if I place a test pole near a magnet, what will be the direction in which it is going to move? What will be the path that is taken by that test pole? That will be a field line. So, we can actually describe magnetic field using field lines. A field line is the path taken by a test pole placed near the magnet. And our test pole will be a unit north pole. Now, a unit north pole placed near a bar magnet will move away from its north pole and move towards its south pole. Now, look at this illustration here. If I place a unit north pole here, it will move away from the north pole and move towards the south pole. So, I can actually draw large number of field lines like this. So, this is a picture of the magnetic field of this magnet. I would like, to take, I would like you to take a good look at this. The field lines are crowded around the poles and they are farther apart as we move away from the magnet. So, the path taken by the unit test pole is called a field line. And I have uh, illustrated that further. If I keep a very small magnet, since a unit north pole is rather difficult to find, I would rather use a very small magnet like the one I showed you. Now, here, I can use something like this. And if I keep it near the magnet, you can see the North Pole will point away from the North Pole and towards the South Pole. And moving it around, I can actually trace 
a field line. And in a similar way, I can trace any number of field lines. All right. Now, magnetic field lines that describe a magnetic field are similar to the electric field that we have been talking about. So you're familiar with it. Now, therefore, if I ask you, what is the magnetic field of a bar magnet is like, you can now tell me how it looks like. Now, we talked about magnetic field. We talked about electric field some time ago. And if I ask you what is the unit for measuring electric field, I'm sure you can tell me. What is the unit for measuring magnetic field? Magnetic field is measured in a unit called Tesla, represented by the uppercase T. Now, a common unit used for measuring magnetic field is the Gauss, uppercase G. And the relation between the two is 1 Gauss is 10 to the power of negative 4 of a torque of a Tesla. So Tesla is actually a larger unit. Okay, let me see if I can take you to a website and show you how to trace the magnetic field line. Now if you notice there is a small magnet which well can be approximated to be a dipole. That's the North Pole, that's the South Pole. Now, this is the south end of a bar magnet, this is the north end, and you can see how the small magnet is behaving. The north is pointing towards the south. And if you now move it around, you can actually trace a field line. Well, what all you need to do is click on it and move. There you have one field line. You can place the magnet anywhere else and draw another field line, there you are, now a third field line, a fourth one, we can draw any number of field lines like this. Now look at the way the magnetic field around the, ba around the bar magnet develops, is that right? That's very interesting. All right, I would like you to look at uh, this website and maybe play around with it and see how the magnetic field around the bar magnet looks like. Now, how do you know if a magnetic field is present in a given region? Well, what all we need to do is to use a compass needle like this. If there is a magnetic field, you can see when I bring the magnet you know there is a magnetic field created and what does the compass needle do? It sort of get agitated. Now what it's trying to do is to align itself in the direction of the magnetic field. So a compass needle will always want to align itself in the direction of the magnetic field. So you can use a compass needle to detect a magnetic field. Now a magnetic field can be created only by a magnet. Is there any other way to create a magnetic field? Well, we're going to see an electric current can actually produce a magnetic field. So, in our next discussion, we're going to look at the electric field created by, I'm sorry, the magnetic field created by an electric current. I would like you to look at uh, this demonstration compass needle here which will detect the presence of a magnetic field. Well, you know if I bring a magnet, there you are, it is uh, moving around showing that there is a magnetic field. Now, I have a battery here. I'm going to keep a wire over the compass. I'm going to allow a current to flow in it. Now when I connect these two, a current is going to flow. Now watch what happens when the current flows. When the current flows in the wire, a magnetic field is generated around it. Well, that's an important concept. An electric current has a magnetic field associated with it.
I have uh, illustrated that concept here. When a current flows in the wire, in the conductor, a magnetic field exists around it and it is shown by the deflection of the compass needle. Well, if there is a magnetic field, then we must talk about the direction of the magnetic field. Remember, magnetic field is a vector quantity. It has a direction and a magnitude. What is the direction of the magnetic field? That is our next concept. Now, this illustration actually gives a relation between the direction of current and the direction of the magnetic field. There is a law that can be easily used to explain this, and that is called the right-hand rule. The right-hand rule. Now, what does the law say? It says, if you wrap your fingers of your right hand, now when I show this, when I sh lift my right hand, it will look like the left hand on the picture, is that right? But I am lifting my right hand. If you wrap the four fingers of your right hand around a conductor carrying the current, so that the thumb indicates the direction of the current, you see that? then the direction in which the other four fingers wrap around the conductor gives you the direction of the magnetic field. That means if the current flows up, then the field will be towards you on the right and towards me on the left. Again, you got to make amends for the picture that you're seeing. Because when I say on my right, it will look on your left. <clears throat> but if I show it here, look at this. The direction of the current is upward, then the field will be to the right of the conductor into the board and out from the board on the left. The direction of the field will be like this. That's what the right hand rule tells you. Now, practice that. So again, if you wrap the four fingers of your right hand around the conductor with the thumb indicating the direction of the current, then the direction in which you wrap the four fingers will give you the direction of the field. Well, we will now look at a familiar concept called flux. Remember, all the quantities we are discussing here, we are already familiar. You know what electric flux is. Similarly, we talk about magnetic flux. The flux of a magnetic field, we represent that by phi sub b, magnetic flux. Remember the letter phi is what we generally use for flux. So phi sub b represent the magnetic flux. Now, how, what's the definition of the magnetic flux? Look at the magnetic lines of force crossing a given area. Magnetic flux crossing a given area is a measure of the total magnetic lines of force crossing at right angles to that surface. Now, magnetic field B is a measure, therefore, of normal flux per unit area. You know these definitions. B equal to phi B divided by A. Magnetic field is a measure of flux per unit area. What will be the unit, therefore? What's the unit for flux? Well, let's develop a unit for flux by rearranging this equation. If B equal to phi B over A, that means normal flux per unit area, then total flux is B times A. So now give me a unit for magnetic flux. Magnetic field is measured in Tesla, and area is measured in meter squared, Therefore, the unit for magnetic flux will be Tesla square meter. It's Tesla meter squared, and it has a name. It's called Weber 
uppercase W and lowercase b. Well, these are important concepts as we go on. So, one weather is one tesla meter square. Well, what happens if the magnetic flux makes an angle with the surface? If the magnetic field B makes an angle theta with the normal to the surface. If you draw a normal to the surface, and if the magnetic field is at an angle to that normal, then phi B will be BA cos theta. Well, if all the lines of force are at exactly at right angles, then we don't have that angle there. Is that right? All right. Now, the concept of cost product is known to you from the earlier discussions we had in electricity. Now, as I said, we're going to use all those concepts back in magnetic field and magnetic flux. What is the cross product of two vectors? How do you measure the cross product of two vectors? Now, you know the dot product. Unlike the dot product of two vectors, the cross product of two vectors is a vector. Is that right? And it is given by this relation. A cross B, the cross product of two vectors A and B, is the magnitude of A multiplied by the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between the two vectors. Well, I showed you a method of finding the cross product of two vectors earlier. Shall we go over that one more time? Now, if A cross B is directed along the positive Z axis, then B cross A will be directed along the negative Z axis. You see, the cross product of two vectors is a vector. That means A cross B and B cross A are not the same vector. If A cross B is directed along the positive Z direction, then B cross A will be an opposite vector. That means a cross B equal to negative of B cross A. Well, if U and V are two vectors defined in the component form, I'm going to give you an example. Suppose U is 2i minus 3j plus 5k. I'm, I'm sure you know what they are. And V is i plus 2j plus 4k. Now, how many of you recall how to find the cross product of these two vectors? I'm going to do that again for you. Now, we write the vectors like this, i, j, k, and the first vector, 2i minus 3j plus 5k, the second vector, i plus 2j plus 4k. Now, the cross product has an x component, to find the x component, what do we do? Cross out the cross out the column and row containing i and do like this negative three times four minus two times five. So the x component will be i times negative three times four minus two times five. Now minus j times, do the same thing, 2 times 4 minus 1 times 5 plus. Now, if you start with positive, then negative, then positive. k times, k times what? Cross out this column and this row. It will be 2 times 2 minus 1 times negative 3. And that will give me negative 22i minus 3j plus 7k. That's how we find the cross product of two vectors. Now, it follows from the definition of cross product. I'm going to give you some results now. If uh, u cross v is negative of v cross u, then what is i cross i? 
Well, remember, the angle between the two vectors is zero. Is that right? I and I are the same vector. The angle theta is zero. So, magnitude of vector I times magnitude of this vector I times sine of the angle. Sine zero is zero. Therefore, I cross I is zero. J cross J is zero. K cross K is also zero. In other words, if you take the cross product of two vectors which are the same, A cross A is zero. B cross B is zero. Why? Because the angle between the two vectors, the same two vectors, is zero. And sine zero is zero. Well, you also know, therefore, I cross J is the same as K. J cross K equal to I, and K cross I equal to J. You see, it's easy to remember. I, J, K. I cross J equal to K. J, K, I. J cross K equal to I. I, J, K, I. K cross I equal to J. Now, it's good to remember that. I cross, I cross J equal to K. J cross K equal to I. And K cross I equal to J. How about I cross K? I cross K is negative J. K cross J is negative I. And J cross I is negative K. Alright, we will use that for a problem. Now, let's now talk about force on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. Now remember, there is always force between two magnets. A current carrying conductor is a magnet. So if you place a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field, the two magnetic fields will interact. That means if you place a conductor in a magnetic field, and allow a current to flow in that conductor, that conductor will move. You have any doubt about that? Well, we will have a look at that. Now here I have arranged a contraption with a magnet. This is the North Pole. Now, it's, you can, it caught hold of my stick. That's the North Pole. I'm going to take it away. Now, if this is the North Pole, that is the South Pole. That means the direction of the field is... Now, look at this. It is this way. That's the direction of the field. That means if I stand here, it will be from you towards me. North Pole to South Pole. I'm going to pass a current through this wire in this direction. What's the direction there? And I'm, I'm going to use my left hand to indicate that because we're going to work out a rule. Look at the middle finger here. That I'm going to place along the wire indicating the direction of the current. And the direction of the field will be my forefinger, which is towards me. So look at that. I'm going to, this is my left hand. The middle finger is in the direction of the current. And I need to do a little acrobatics. The middle finger is in the direction of the current. Look at my middle finger. The forefinger is in the direction of the field. And the force experienced by the conductor should then be my thumb. Now, I'm going to allow the current to flow. When I connect this, when I make that connection, I wanted to watch it. Now, I make the connection. There you are. When I make the connection, which direction does the wire move? It moves down. Is that right? Now, if I change the direction of the current, I'm going to reverse the polarity here and see what direction the wire moves. It's moving up. Now, this time the current is this way. So, one more time, I'm going to move back the 
polarity so that the current flows that way. It's easy for me to show. Now look at that rule again. Stretch the three fingers of your left hand. The middle finger, the forefinger, and the thumb, and they must be in three mutually perpendicular directions. If this is X, this is Y, this must be Z. And place the middle finger in the direction of the current, and the forefinger in the direction of the field. I think I'm going to reverse it so that it's, again, easier. Which direction is the current now? The current is this way. Is that right? And the field, well, the current is this way, the field is that way, and therefore, watch it again. Can you see this? The current, I'm going to allow the current to flow that way, the field is that way, then the force must be upward. Let's have a look. There you are. Force is upward. So practice that Fleming's left hand rule for the direction of the force experienced by a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. What is the reason for such a force? Now here I have a current carrying conductor. Now imagine that the conductor is coming from behind the board outside, from coming from, from through the board so that the magnetic field created by it. Now remember we talked about the direction of the magnetic field due to a current. Now that means if, you, if your thumb indicates the direction of the current, the direction in which you wrap your fingers is the field. So look at this. If this is the conductor coming out of the board, the direction of the current, if the current goes into the board, the field is down to the right and up to the left. So this is the magnetic field due to the current in a conductor and this is the magnetic field due to a magnet. That means this conductor is placed in this field so these two fields will interact. Now what kind of interaction will happen? If you look at this, the direction of the field here will be from right to left. That means in this region the field of the magnet and the field of the current are opposite. That means the, f the two fields are almost going to cancel. How about above the wire? See, if the wire is like this, so below the wire the two fields will cancel and above the wire the two fields are in the same direction. And so what you get is the resultant like this. The field above the wire will be very intense and the field below the wire will be very weak. And therefore, what is the interaction there? The lines of force are very close there. That means they will push against each other. So these lines of force will push the conductor from the strong field towards the weak field. And this is the mechanism of the force experienced by the conductor. In other words, it appears that the wire is being catapulted. You know what, how a catapult works? When you use the tension on a rubber band to throw a, an object, is that right? So the wire is actually catapulted from the strong field to the weak field region. That's the mechanism of the force experienced. And the direction of the force is given by Fleming's left hand rule. I explained that to you. Now, <coughs> stretch the three fingers of your left hand, the middle finger, the forefinger, and the thumb, in three mutually perpendicular directions, such that, watch again, the middle finger indicates the direction of the current, the forefinger in the direction of the field, then the thumb will indicate the direction of the force. So the current 
field, then that will be the force. All right. Now, here, you can see here the north pole, south pole. That means the field will be downward. The current goes that way. Can you use your fingers there? Now, the field will be... If, let me see if I can use my left hand. Now, the field is downward. The current is that way. Now, look at my thumb. The thumb actually shows the force. Try and work it out on your own using your own left hand, the three fingers. Now, what are the factors on which the force on a conductor depend on? Well, if you have a conductor of length dL, now look at that, length dL inside the magnetic field carrying a current I, and the direction of the current I makes an angle theta with the direction of the field. This is our situation. So, the force experienced by a current carrying conductor depends on the current I in the conductor, the amount of current in the conductor. It depends on the length dL of the conductor inside the magnetic field. It also depends on the angle theta between what and what? Between the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field. Now, these are the three things on which the direction of the, the amount of force experienced by a current carrying conductor depend on. And I'm going to now write an equation. If dF is the force experienced by this small element of the conductor that carries a current I, and if theta is the angle between the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field, then dF is given by I dL B sine theta. And how do you write this using cross product? It is I dL which is a vector. <coughs> I times dL is a vector and B is a vector. It is I dL cross B. And that is the amount of force experienced by a conductor of length dL carrying a current I placed in a magnetic field B such that the angle between B and I is theta. Then the force experienced by that conductor DF equal to I DL B sine theta, which is the same as I DL cross B. And you can see that force is perpendicular to both I and B because the cross product of two vectors is perpendicular to both the vectors. Let's do a small example. A 5 mm long wire segment carries a current of 2 ampere in the x direction. It is placed in the magnetic field of 0.3, 0 0.35 Tesla in the xy plane at an angle of 45 degrees. Calculate the magnetic force experienced by the wire segment. It's a direct problem. You are given all the quantities that you need. Just pick the quantities. <clears throat> Our equation is dF equal to I dL B sine theta. Do we have all these quantities? We have I as 2 ampere, dL the length of the conductor is 5 millimeter, write that in meters. And do we have B? Yes, we have. It will be 0.35. And the angle is 45 degrees. And therefore, that force is 0 0.0025 Newton. A very simple problem. So, since the current I and the magnetic field B are both in the xy plane, what will be the direction of this uh, force? DF will be in the positive z direction. 
So in a problem like this, it is not enough to calculate the magnitude. You also have to obtain the direction, because that force is a vector. And therefore, the final answer is DF is 0 0.0025 Newton K. The force is in the positive Z direction. Let's do another one. A little more involved problem. A 10 centimeter length wire carries a current of 4 ampere in the positive Z direction. The force on this wire due to a magnetic field B is negative 2i plus 0.2j newton. If this wire is now rotated so that the current flows in the positive x direction, the force on the wire is F equal to 0.2k newton. Find the, magnet, the, the magnetic field B. Well, this is a little more involved problem. Here we have two situations. First, the current is flowing in the positive Z direction. And at that time, the force on that conductor is this. And uh, the wire is rotated so that the current flows in the positive x direction. The new force is this. We got to use these two situations. All right, let's pick the data. The length of the conductor that carries current is 0.1 meter, 10 centimeter. The current is 4 ampere. So I is 4 ampere. The force is given to be negative 2.2I plus 0.2J Newton. Now, I times DL, I times DL is 0.4K. Why? Because the current is in the K direction. So IBL is the vector that is 0.4K. Now, you know that F equal to IDL cross B is the cross product of these two vectors. Now, we know both, both the vectors. The vector IDL is 0.4K and the vector B is this. All right, let's take the cross product and see what happens. <clears throat> well, we don't know B, do we? We know the vector F. We know I, D, L, but we don't know B. We need to find B. So, let's start by saying, let B be B, X, I, plus B, Y, J, plus B, Z, K. Well, that they are the three components of the magnetic field of B. So, let B be B, X, I, plus B, Y, J, plus B, Z, K. Now, let's put all these in this equation. We know the vector F. That is the vector F. We know IDL. That's the vector IDL. And this is the vector B. Now, putting it all together, we have F equal to IDL cross B. And that is, I replaced F by 0.4K. So that would be 0.4k cross B, BXI plus BYJ plus BZK. Now, we take the cross product. When you take the cross product, <coughs> the first one will be 0.4k cross BXI. Now, what is K cross I? You remember that one? Look at that. We need K cross I, K cross J, and K cross K. Well, and that quantity will be equal to that F. Well, I'm going to come again. Now, F is the vector, vector given by this. This is the ideal vector, not F that I said first. 0.4K is the ideal vector. Cross, this is the B vector. So, IDL cross B equal to the force vector. All right. Now, you know that K cross I equal to J. That means 0.4K 
cross BXI will be 0.4 BXJ. Is that right? Because, because K cross I equal J and K cross J will be negative I and K cross K will be zero. All right, let's use that to write this now. <clears throat> now, I have 0.4 by negative i. I wrote that first because that is the x component. Look at that. 0.4 k cross b by j. k cross j is negative i. 0.4 b by i. Now let's take this product. 0.4 k cross b x i. k cross i is j. 0.4 b x J. So the product, this product will now give you this, y k cross k is zero. And therefore, point negative point four b y i plus point four b x j is the force vector that we already know. Now we can now equate the i the x components and the j components and obtain by and bx. Is that right? So what is by equal to? by equal to negative 0.2 divided by 0.4 that is 0.5 tesla. And bx equal to 0.2 divided by 0.4 that is also 0.5 tesla. So by and bx both are 0.5 tesla. Well, we found the y component, we found the x component, we now need to find the z component. And that is where we're going to use the second situation. All right, can you go back and repeat the same process for the second situation? That is, when the conductor is rotated so that the current is now in the x direction, the new force is 0.2 K. Let's use that. <coughs> we have Bx we know, we calculate it, By we know, and the ideal vector is now 0.4 I. It is now in the x direction. Now, when the current flows in the positive x direction, ideal is a positive x vector and is equal to 0.4i. And therefore, look at it again, ideal cross B equal to F. Is that right? Force is the cross product of the vector ideal and the vector B. Now, this time, ideal is 0.41i, and the vector B is bxi plus byj plus bzk, where we calculated bx and by, we don't know bz. And the force vector this time is 0.2k. Now, use i cross i equal to zero, I cross J equal to K and I cross K equal to negative J and so 0.4i cross BXI that will be zero and 0.4i cross B by J will be 0.4 BYK because I cross J equal to K and 0.4i cross bzk will be negative 0.4 bzj because i cross k is negative j. So the left hand side simplifies to this and the right hand side is 0.2k. Well, we know by, therefore we can now find bz, the z component and that will give you bz equal to zero. Therefore, the, the magnetic field is 0.5 ti 
plus 0.5 tj and the z component is zero. That has been a good problem and uh, take some time and practice this problem. Just now look at the concept of force on a charge moving in a magnetic field. Well, electric current is caused by the motion of elect electric charges. So if a conductor carrying an electric current experiences a force, it means an electric charge moving in a magnetic field must experience a force. So a moving charge is equivalent to an electric current and hence it has <coughs> a magnetic field around it. As a moving charge enters a magnetic field, the two magnetic fields will interact producing a force on the moving charge. Now, this force is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field B and the component of the velocity of the charged particle at right angles to B. Now, that means the force will be significant only if the direction of motion is at right angles to the direction of the, of, of the field. If the charge moves in the direction of the field, there will be no force on it. There will be force on the charge only if there is an angle between the direction of the field and the direction of motion. And the force will be maximum when that angle is 90 degrees. So, a charge Q moving with a velocity V at an angle theta with the magnetic field B will experience a force given by, this is the equation, F equal to QV cross B, where QV is the first vector and B is the second vector. That again is a cross product. And we can write it like this. QV B sine theta. And that means this quantity is maximum when sine theta is 1. And sine theta becomes 1 when that theta is 90 degrees. So the force is always at right angles to the direction of motion and it doesn't speed up the charge. <coughs> this force will not make the charge accelerate in the direction in which it's moving. Why? Because if the motion is in that direction, the force will be at right angles to it. Now tell me, what does a force at right angles to a motion do? When an object is moving, a force at right angles to the motion will keep the object in a circular path. So, Instead, the direction of motion is continuously changing, making the charge to move in a circle. So, if a charge is placed in the xy plane, let me see if I can I have a diagram. Now, here I have the xy plane, and these dots indicate the, the magnetic field coming from out of the board. The magnetic field is actually coming out of the board, that is, coming towards you when you are watching. Now, a charge is placed in the xy plane, this is the xy plane, at right angles to a magnetic field in the z direction, then the charge will move in a circle like this. Now, since the velocity v of the charge is always at always at an angle to the direction of B, the force will be QVB if that angle is a right angle. If theta is 90 degrees, that sine theta will be zero. So, in this case, the angle between the magnetic field, which is in that direction, and the direction of motion in the XY plane, the angle will be always 90 degrees, so the force will be QVB. 
Now, this is a measure of the centripetal force that makes the charge move in a circle. Therefore, we can take this quantity QVB and set it equal to the centripetal force. What is the equation for the centripetal force? MV squared over R, where M is the mass of that charge, V is its velocity, and R is its radius. So QVB equal to MV squared over R. And we can use this to solve for R, the radius of the circle, R equal to MV over QB. Now, what is the period of a circular motion? The period of a circular motion is the time taken for one complete circle. Now, that is, I think we can calculate the period, the time taken as the length of the period, the length of the circle, that is 2 pi r, and divided by the velocity. Is that right? Yes. The period t is 2 pi r, 2 pi r is the length of that circle, and divided by the velocity, that will give you the time taken for one complete circle. Now, replace that R here by MV over QB. That gives me 2 pi times MV over QB over V. And rearrange it. That gives me the period T is 2 pi M divided by QB. In other words, the period T doesn't depend on the velocity. All right, if period T is 2 pi m over QB, what is the frequency of such a motion? The frequency and the period are inverse of each other. So the frequency will be QB divided by 2 pi m. You may not be able to see that on the screen very well. <coughs> Let's uh, solve another problem. An electron traveling at 3.5 times 10 to the 7 meter per second enters a magnetic field of 0 0.056 Tesla at right angles to the direction of motion of the electron. Calculate the centripetal force on the electron, its period and frequency. <coughs> well, we have everything that we need the radius of a the radius of the circle described by the charge will be mv over qb and using the standard values of m and q of electron do you know the mass of an electron and the charge on it well mass of the electron is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilogram its velocity is given the charge of an electron is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and the field is 0 0.056 Tesla, and that gives you 0 0.0035 meter, and that is the radius of the circle. And we need to find the centripetal force. Centripetal force is mv squared over r, and we know all that quantities. M we know, V we know, R we calculated. And substituting that gives me 3.2 times 10 to the negative 13 Newton is the centripetal force. Well, what is its period? Period is 2 pi r divided by v. We know all those values. That is 6.3 times 10 to the negative 10 second. Well, if you know the period, you know the frequency. Frequency is 1.59 times 10 to the 9 hertz. That's a good problem. And you must be familiar with problems of this type. We will now look at another interesting concept, torque on a current carrying coil in a magnetic field. If a, coil of, if a coil of wire 
is placed in the magnetic field, how will it behave? I can make a coil of wire by taking a wire and winding it on a frame like this. Now, I'm actually making a coil. Now, imagine there is a magnetic field here coming from the board towards you. Now, let's take Fleming's left-hand rule. The magnetic field is from the board towards you, that is the forefinger. <coughs> and if the current now flows on this wire here in this direction, middle finger, then this end must move up. That means if a current flows in this coil, which is in this direction, that is towards me on the right side, <coughs> there you got the magnetic field towards you, the current towards me, then this end must move up. Now, because of this coil, if the current is flowing towards me on this side, then the current must flow away from me on the other side. That means, if this end experiences a force upward, this will experience a force downward. So, <coughs> there are going to be two forces on this coil. On the right side, the force will be upward. On the left side, the force will be downward. What will those two forces do? Those two forces will rotate the coil. And so, we're now going to look at the torque. You understand the word, we have done that in physics 1. These two forces will actually produce a torque. Now, imagine you have a, a ruler here. There is a force upward on one end, a force downward on the other end. These two forces will rotate it. Okay, so once again, Consider a rectangular coil of wire of length A, that's the length A, and width B, carrying a current I in the direction indicated. On the left side, the current is upward. On the right side, the current is downward. All right. What happens? The force on the left side of length A will be, what will be the, the amount of force? Will be IAB directed into the paper. Now, <clears throat> how do you find that direction? Look at that again. The current is upward. The direction, can you follow what I'm doing here? That is the direction of the current upward. The the field is that way, so if you look at that, the current upward, the field is that way, therefore the force will be into the board. So the force on this side will be into the board, and the force on the other side will be out of the board. So the force on the right side will be F2 equal to IA be directed out of the paper. Now, each of these forces produce a torque on the coil about an axis through its center. This is the axis of the coil, and as a result, the coil will rotate about that axis. The torque of F1 will be, remember, if the force here is directed into the board, the torque will be that force multiplied by this distance, which is half of B. So that will be IAB times one half B. And that can be simplified as one half I uppercase A. Now, the lowercase A times lowercase B is length times width, which is the area of this coil. So A times B is replaced by the uppercase A, the area of the coil. So the torque of F1 is one half I A B, I is the current, A is the area of the coil, and B is the magnetic field. Now the torque of the other force F2 similarly will be one half I A B.
So, here I have a, the torque due to one force and the torque due to the other force, both about this axis. And therefore, what is the net torque? The net torque will be the sum of these two, which will be I times A times B. So when a coil of total area A is placed in a magnetic field B and a current I passes through that coil, that coil will experience a torque given by tau equal to I A B and it will rotate. Now, that is if the coil has just one turn. If the coil has n turns, the total torque will be NIAB. That's an important relation. Now the quantity NIA is a vector, and that vector is normal to the plane of the coil and is called the magnetic moment and we represent it by mu. So the quantity NIA is called the magnetic moment of the coil and therefore tau can be written as tau equal to mu b where mu is called the magnetic moment of the coil. Now if theta is the angle between the direction of b and the normal to the plane of the coil then I can write tau equal to that means if theta is the angle between B and the normal to the plane, that's the angle theta. Then tau will be NAIB sine theta. Now remember, when this theta is 90 degrees, the sine theta is 1, and the tau will be NAIB, which is mu times B. If theta is other than 90 degrees, then tau will be NAI. You can see that A, I have a small printing error there, that A must be uppercase A, area of the coil. N uppercase A I B sine theta. And that can be written as mu cross B because NAI is the vector call the magnetic moment of the coil. That is. So the torque experienced by a coil carrying a current placed in the magnetic field is mu cross B. And I've illustrated that concept here, why the torque actually occurs. The catapult effect which we talked about a while ago. Let's talk, do a small problem. A rectangular coil of wire of length 5 cm and width 3 cm is made up of 22 turns of a conducting wire. The current in the coil is 3.2 ampere and the axis of the coil makes an angle of 37 degrees with the magnetic field of 500 tesla. Calculate the magnitude of the torque on the coil. That's a very simple problem, is that right? Well, first we obtain the area of the coil. We know the length of the coil, we know the width of the coil. Therefore, the area of the coil, which is the uppercase A, is length multiplied by width, and that is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared. And the magnetic moment is therefore NIA, is that right? That's the quantity we call mu, which is the number of turns multiplied by the current times the area. And that is 22 times 3.2 ampere times that area. That is 0 0.106 ampere meter squared. Well, we need to find the, the torque. And the torque is mu b sine theta. Is that right? N i a b sine theta. N a i is the magnetic moment. So tau equal to mu b sine 37 degrees. 
and we know all those quantities. That gives you 31.8 meter newton. Another problem. A current carrying wire is bent in the form of a square of side 6 cm and is placed in the xy plane. It carries a current I equal to 2.5 ampere. What is the torque on the wire if there is a uniform magnetic field of 0.3 Tesla in the z direction and 2 in the x direction? Well, remember, the force will depend on the direction of the field. Well, we have a N equal to 1. It's a one-turn coil. And the side of the square is 0 0.06 meter, means its area will be the square of that, 0 0.0036 meter square. The current is given. The magnetic field is given, and since the coil is in the xy plane, the normal vector, well, the xy plane is, well, that's the xy plane, the normal vector will be k, is that right? So, n, the normal vector is k. The magnetic moment is n a i k. It's a vector in the k direction. And that will be, and we know the area of the coil we calculated, and the current is given. Therefore, the magnetic moment is 0 0.009 k. Now, in the first case, the field is in the z direction. That means the angle theta is zero. The angle theta is the angle between the direction of the field and the direction of the normal vector to the, to the plane. So this is the xy plane. The normal is a z vector. That means in the first case, the angle between b and n is zero. If the angle is zero, sine zero is zero, therefore torque will be zero. On the other hand, when B is in the x direction, that angle will be 90 degrees, and therefore the torque will be mu B sine 90 degrees, that will be 0 0.0027 J meter Newton. So, what that means is, when the coil is in the direction, it is zero, there is no torque. But when the coil makes an angle of 90 degrees, the torque will be a maximum. I illustrated that to you earlier. Now, here we have now the concept of an electric motor. Well, if a coil of wire is placed in a in a magnetic field, that coil will experience a torque and rotate, and that is how an electric motor is made. So, the torque experienced by a coil of wire carrying a current placed in a magnetic field can produce continuous rotation. Now, this principle of work, this is the, actually the principle of working of an electric motor. I have actually explained that principle here. Now, if I can wind a coil of wire on a frame like this and place it inside a magnetic field, there's a magnet, there's a north pole and a south pole there, so that the coil is inside a magnetic field. And then, when a current is allowed to flow, the coil will rotate. But there is a problem. And what's the problem? If the current flows on the right towards me, then the current on the left will go away from me. So if the force on this is downward, the force on the other side will be upward, right? After half a rotation, 
Well, the force on this side will be downward. So how would you get a continuous rotation? The only way to get continuous rotation is when it completes half a rotation, the direction of current must change. The current that was flowing towards me on this side, when it completes half a rotation, the current must be in the opposite direction so that the force will change. Now, I have actually made a contraption and I would like to show it to you before I close the lesson today. Now here I have made this coil and the ends of the coil are connected to these brushes. And uh, when I connect uh, those brushes to the battery, what happens is the brushes, the, the, the right brush which is in contact with the positive, when you rotate after half a rotation, it will come and make contact with the left brush. That means for every rotation, the current, the direction of the current will change and I will get continuous rotation. Now watch this when I make that connection. There you are. I get continuous rotation by changing the current halfway through. And the current is changed by using these brushes. So the electric motor, the brushes are very important. All right. All right, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. We will continue this concept again in the next lesson.